Hello, everyone. My name is Todd Zuberbeer, and I'm the head of the Board of Family Ministry here at St. Luke's. And whether you know it or not, uh, we have the officer elections coming up in about three weeks, uh, November 10th, Tuesday, 7 p.m., right here in this very sanctuary. Um, my purpose here tonight is to kind of tell you a little bit about what the Board of Family Ministry does and hopefully pique some interest, see if we can get a few new candidates. Um, the Board of Family Ministry here at St. Luke's uh, oversees the Sunday School, the Vacation Bible School, the National Youth Gathering, the high school youth, uh, 9 to 12, the middle school youth, grades 5 and 8, 5 through 8, and family night events. Now, that doesn't mean you have to attend all those things. Um, we do have uh, directors and teachers that kind of run the day-to-day -day events of those, but we kind of oversee everything. Um, we meet once a month, uh, usually the first Monday of the month. Um, lately, it's been virtual, but if we ever get back to uh, meeting in person, uh, we review programs, we allocate money, we discuss new ways to involve families, and uh, we help. Uh, we work with directors and pick programs, and if uh, they're needing teachers, sometimes we get names, and so. Uh, we're involved in just about uh, all the family parts of uh, St. Luke's. Um, typically, we're a group of six. Currently, we have five members. We have uh, Kirsten Mells, Tori Zinsmeister, Jesse Georgius, Rachel Townsend, and myself. Um, four of those five are actually up for re-election, so uh, there's definitely room for people. Um, We've been a board of as low as two and as high as seven since I've been here, so it kind of fluctuates. But uh, if you're interested, hopefully uh, we can get a few new candidates and uh, just call the office and they can get you in touch with myself or one of the other board members. And uh, we'll also talk with Tom, our president, and maybe he can get your name on the ballot. So give us some serious thought and uh, hope to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. It certainly is a joy to lead worship on a day such as this. For those of you who are very well attuned to the color and changes of season within the church life, you've seen that at least for a Sunday, we move from the green of the season of growth to Pentecost into the scarlet that celebrates the defense of the faith as we celebrate the festival of the Reformation. Throughout the course of the day's service, we'll be highlighting the wonderful and, and battle cry uh, psalms of the Reformation, as well as the gospel reading from that of St. John that's brought into our confession this day. We also have opportunity then to hear a rather, uh, I'll say it this way, peculiar, not strange, but something unique to the Reformation, and that is a stalwart reading that comes to us from Revelation chapter 14. In celebration of the Reformation and pointing to that reading from Revelation, these are our gathering notes for our festival on this day. To the consternation of his opponents, Jesus announced that those who abide in his word know the truth which sets them free. And the truth, as St. Paul points out in the epistle, is that God has declared us justified, that is, not guilty under his law, because of his gracious gift of faith in Jesus Christ. That gift frees us from fearing God's righteous wrath. We are confident that the Lord of hosts is with us, sure of his presence and his divine protection. We need not fear the forces of nature, the conflicts of people or nations, or the wiles of the devil himself. Rather, in all that we think and say and do, we are free to respond to the angelic invitation that we hear today in Revelation 14, fear God and give him glory and worship him who made heaven and earth. As we celebrate all of these core readings that make up our Reformation festival, we also point to Jesus as the author and perfecter of our faith, leaning on that justification and celebrating his grace. I'll invite you to stand as you are able. Our service this day opens with the prayer of the day, which prepares us to echo the wonderful readings that come from Psalm 46, from Romans chapter 3, and from John chapter 8. May the Lord be with you. 
Thank you. And let us pray. O Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and your truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is our refuge and strength. Therefore, we will not fear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. If you abide in my word, says our Lord and Savior Jesus, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Celebrating our reading this day from Revelation chapter 14, hear the word of the Lord. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Having celebrated the word of God, we come close to his mercy seat as we share together our corporate confession of sin. O Lord of hosts, hear our confession of sins and grant us your mercy and forgiveness. We have not trusted in your promised protection and strength, but have looked elsewhere for help and refuge. You alone have provided the remedy for that which truly causes our separation, troubles, and death. For the sake of Christ, your Son, our Redeemer, grant us forgiveness and deliverance from all that would keep us from your present help. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord in today's absolution. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Because that river of grace and power has flowed over us in our baptism into the death and resurrection of Christ, in spite of our fear, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. By grace, God has created each of us and everything that exists and in the person of his Son entered our history and paid for our every sin and sin itself. In Christ's resurrection, God's promises have been made sure. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So now we celebrate the day's Kyrie where God's mercy is made manifest. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord of hosts, have mercy. For those living in fear because of sudden disaster, let us pray to the Lord. Lord of creation, have mercy. For those living in fear because of the evil intentions of people in power, let us pray to the Lord. Lord of lords, have mercy. For those living in fear because of evil forces within the church and oppression beyond it, let us pray to the Lord. Christ our Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. I welcome you to be seated for the day's epistle. As we move from our first reading, celebrating the day's epistle, we echo the beautiful words from Romans chapter 3 that find us rooted in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. St. Paul shares in Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. 
But now the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hearing the battle cries of the Reformation, we join in singing them, celebrating hymn number 50, I'm sorry, 656, verses 1, 3, and 4 of the Reformation hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
is a sincere joy to continue preaching the Reformation truths that not, have not only bound our congregation together, but celebrate the greatest gospel to be proclaimed throughout the world, that of God's grace and justification in and through the person, life, and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. Many of you see before you the, the wonderful seal that is Luther's rose that celebrates not only his famed conviction, but also brings to the table the wealth of good in sharing and proclaiming the gospel. Each part of Luther's rose and seal celebrating in many ways the answer to the question that we get to ask every day we wake up, and that is to say, how do we get to proclaim Jesus today? The peculiar part of that gospel, then, is to come to such an amazing celebration in the Reformation, leaning heavily on the likes of Romans 3, which we shared just moments ago, looking to the abiding gospel that is in John chapter 8, and then of many, many pillars, celebrating the likes of Psalm 46, these things we know, we sing, we've memorized, we champion as Lutheran Christians. And then there's a reading that just seems to have slipped in, and I'm sure if you're like me, you think about the likes of, say, Revelation 14, and you might wonder, how did this reading become part of the traditional pillars of the Reformation celebration? Two verses from Revelation chapter 14 and it's St. John sharing the vision that was given him. He says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water. If you, like many, maybe better, if you, like me, had opportunity to see that text unfold for the likes of today's focus, you too may be asking the question, why? In small history, there are times where we look to heroes of faith and we imagine for ourselves the life that they lived in Martin Luther's case, the gospel that he championed for the benefit of all people. And we might ask ourselves for what has been proclaimed, for what we've seen demonstrated, for the lasting conviction in spite of oppression, why is it that a reading like this would have entered the Festival of Reformation? How is it perhaps that a reading like this might celebrate the way that God took the life and times of someone like Martin Luther and then raised them up to be part of his divine plan for salvation. Well, in Luther's life, it looks like this. This text is something rather crucial in the understanding of the context that Martin Luther was born into, the times in which he taught, the way that he celebrated the five pillars of our Christian faith, the six chief parts of his small catechism, and then vaulted us forward to a place where we might actually begin to appreciate that we have a triune God in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who aims to have an eternal relationship with us. When it comes to this Revelation 14 reading, the first time that it is mentioned in the life and times of Martin Luther is in the year 1522. There was a man by the name of Michael Stiefel who brought together a poem that celebrated this championed gospel, this eternal gospel that was to be proclaimed. And looking at the proclaimer that was Martin Luther in the days of his preaching, this poem written written by Michael Stiefel, celebrated Martin Luther as if he might be the angel of revelation 
that is mentioned in Revelation 14, simply rooted in the work that Martin was doing at the time along the lines of saying, fear God and give him glory. So often as part of the Reformation, we celebrate what we consider to be the solas when it comes to those things by which we rely upon God. By faith alone, by grace alone, by scripture alone, all of those wonderful things that would have us give God glory. Even Luther in his writings would echo that familiar sentiment of soli deo gloria, to God be all glory. In the year 1522, it would have been the preaching notes and the lecture notes of Martin Luther that his students would have stolen off of his desk and taken into the, the, the uh, say like the production office where the printing presses were and printed off a little thing uh, as far back as 1517 known as Luther's small catechism. By 1522, Luther's protest and renown would have spread among the Germanic people. And so it was especially in that day when it came to disease, when it came to oppression, when it came to government control, many in Luther's orbit saw him to be a proclaimer of this amazing gospel, the one thing that would bring hope to a people in the midst of duress. It would sound even within our climate today, we sorely need to celebrate that same kind of gospel that brings hope in the midst of duress. Fast-forwarding through Luther's life and work, not to make short shrift of it, but of course when we worship, we're not worshiping Martin Luther, we're worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Insofar as Luther continued to point to Jesus Christ in his saving gospel, By the time we get to the year 1546, we find Luther's own pastor by the name of Johannes Bugenhagen. There's a name with good German heritage, right? Johannes Bugenhagen stands to give Martin Luther's funeral sermon, and he brings out the same reading from Revelation chapter 14, again comparing Martin Luther to the likes of the angel of Revelation, but not so much according to the militant work, the active work that would continue to give God glory, but rather from a work completed as an encouragement to all the faithful, stressing the portion of the reading that says, even we today, by the model of our father in faith, Martin Luther would have an eternal gospel to proclaim. Not so much because of the comparison to Luther being an angel of revelation. I have the feeling he would have smirked and smiled at that. I would have otherwise maybe seen him shake his head and say, well, no pressure, right? No, of course, Luther in that regard is not the angel of revelation. I think we might all concede to that. Nonetheless, The reading as it bookended Martin Luther's life and work brings us to a place where naturally it becomes part of our celebration in the festival of Revelation because we see, we experience, we are charged by invitation of the real angel of Revelation to go out and give God glory in everything that we say and do to worship him, to fear and honor his name, and certainly to continue to proclaim this eternal gospel. For as much as this makes sense in the life's work of Martin Luther, we know that if we extrapolate a little too much, we start to come away from the biblical text and we only see it through the lens of a human life. And so we want to make sure that we know the more divine context of these things, the background of the text as it was written and shared, say, in St. John's Day. For as much as we might wonder why a reading like Revelation 14 shows up in the Reformation celebration, we might want to compare that allusion and metaphor from Martin Luther's day and see, does it match up with what St. John intended? So what's happening in the text as we experience it? 
What you come to find at the beginning of this vision in Revelation chapter 14, here's what's happening. We're caught up in a battle that will end everything that we know, trust, see, and experience. This is the one battle that will bring an end to all things that we know. And this is what St. John reports in his vision early on. A dragon rises up to attack a woman and her offspring. A beast rises up out of the sea. Another beast comes up out of the earth. Against the backdrop of these worldwide events, St. John reminds us that all things deceiving and destroying are affecting the saints. And so it is to say, among the seven churches that St. John wrote to at the beginning of his letter, these visions are granted uh, in part from the beatitude that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 2, saying, blessed are those who read, mark, learn, and take in the contents of this book. All things pointing to the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ were from a day in St. John's vision where the people of God were feeling it. They knew what it was like to experience pain by way of disease and death in the ways of the world. They were suffering persecution under undue hardship and that of government control. They were also experiencing hostility not only from those who were in their communities, but from within the disunity that came to the church in that day as a part of this worldwide duress. And so St. John is honest about the things that he's seeing. He simply observes and reports. And the people of God who are hearing these visions would probably look and nod to one another and say, sounds about right, we are living in the last days. Now what comes of this vision? Before we get to the text that we have today in Revelation chapter 14, the vision shifts from the duress and depression that has come upon the earth and the deception and otherwise dethroning of the saints on earth. All of a sudden, St. John turns and he sees one that is positioned to be like a lamb in the midst of Zion. And of course, by our worship life and our testimony in good faith, as we proclaim the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ, we don't have to think too long or lean too hard on what we know and experience to know who this Lamb of God is. It's Jesus Christ himself. And so it is, as St. John proclaims these visions of undue duress and hardship, he begs the question of endurance and he points to the suffering Lamb of God and reminds us that in the midst of the world's turmoil, there the Lord God himself abides with his people. That sets the stage for the angel that we see in the mid-heaven hovering over those proclaiming this eternal gospel, bringing hope to the hopeless, continuing those themes that we've seen experienced in our worship life as the church year draws to a close and as we prepare for the gratitude of all things harvest and look forward to the anticipation and hope that comes with Advent. And that might be a crucial hinge point in the reading today. When it comes to the proclamation of eternal gospel, when it comes to the way in which that was proclaimed in St. John's Day, when it was proclaimed under duress and with opposition in Martin Luther's Day, and when we really truthfully appreciate that there's nothing uh, new under the sun, that same truth comes to us and impacts us and not only invites us to participate, but charges and challenges us to carry that gospel outside of these walls to any and all whom we meet. That hinge point is the reality of this angel hovering in mid-heaven. There are some who would say the mid-heaven gospel message would point us to the cross, and that's not so very far off. 
It's a gospel that we celebrate all too often as we gather in this space, looking to the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, even on that first Good Friday. You've heard me say before, how exquisite is that picture of salvation, where we see God fully, I'm sorry, we see Jesus Christ fully God and fully man suspended on the cross between heaven and earth, such a harmony of God's justice and his love. Well after the resurrection, St. John is given this vision where an angel hovers specifically as the Greek text shares in mid-heaven. Why is this so important? Because the eternal gospel that is to be proclaimed is fixed with that angel just as if you would see the sun shining in the sky an ordained heavenly body that's been given its course and will run its course until the day when not opposition, not disease or duress, not oppression, not tyranny, not any power under heaven will end, but that God himself will call to a close. You imagine at that point that this eternal gospel that is to be proclaimed has been firmly fixed in the heavens, will continue to run its course even into eternity. It reminds us that when it comes to the will and desire of our Heavenly Father, this gospel that is to be eternally proclaimed will not be deterred. It will be delivered and it will remain. Just as much as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world dwells in Zion and in the hearts of God's children, in the same way as God himself is by our side upon the plain, in the same way that we're invited to come and go from the presence of God, knowing that he will be with us every time we should utter his saving truths, God will have his eternal gospel eternally proclaimed. It will continue to go forth. It will not stop. It will not be defeated. It cannot be made impure, and it will not be compromised. The eternal gospel that is to be proclaimed is once and for all sealed and fulfilled in Jesus Christ and does not end even in the day when we will see the new heavens and the new earth made and raised before our eyes. As you celebrate the way that you too might proclaim this eternal gospel, as you see the rich themes of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, offering his own self as sacrifice and yet also standing as high priest to intercede for us, as you see the way in which our Heavenly Father lifts the burdens of sin and guilt, of oppression, of tyranny, of helplessness, of hopelessness, we continue to celebrate that saving truth of the Reformation that comes to us where we're sitting today and has us behold the Lamb of God, has us echo the story of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and has us approach the world with a presentation that offers a light and peace and a message of life that the world cannot give itself. In light of the Reformation, in light of its great celebration, in light of our rich heritage and even heroes of faith like Martin Luther, we certainly have one higher that we concede to and appreciate on this day as we wrap ourselves in his saving gospel and carry it into his world. To our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our Heavenly Father, and the power, presence, and peace of his Holy Spirit be all glory now and forever. Amen. As you are able, I'll invite you to stand at this time. As we've celebrated in weeks past, being forgiven and free and hearing the promises that are not simply concealed but made known freely through the gospel, we celebrate our confession of faith. We incorporate the likes of Psalm 46 with the Apostles' Creed as we confess our faith together. Our faith is in God the Father, the Almighty, creator of all that exists. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, who has made me and all creatures. He has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. Our faith is in God the Son, whose sacrifice on the cross opens to us eternal life in God's eternal presence. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. He is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. Our faith is in God the Holy Spirit, whose gift of faith gives us eternal peace with God. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. I'll invite you to be seated as we celebrate the day's offertory in song. As the song washes over you on this day, our anthem, you're welcome to join together at home and even here in person in the words of our offertory prayer. As a whole, we celebrate the day's offertory. I'll invite you to stand at this time as we celebrate the prayer of the church. As we mentioned at the crown of the service, each of our core readings are imbued into the liturgy. We celebrate again the likes of Psalm 46 as we pray. Let us pray for the church here and around the world and for all people in their varied circumstances. O strong creator, wherever people call out to you as the earth gives way, mountains move into the heart of the sea and mountains tremble. Hear their cries and keep them safe. Awaken courage and wisdom in those who search and rescue, those who provide physical and spiritual counsel, and those who offer long-term support of body and life. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Holy Spirit, when nations rage and kingdoms totter, use the earthly powers that be to move the nations and their leaders to seek ways toward peace with their neighbors and stability within their borders. You who make wars cease to the ends of the earth, provide courage and compassion to all who work for peace and protection as they are deployed abroad, and all who maintain concord and order within communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
O gracious God, stream joy and gladness to those who wait for the dawning of a new day, those dealing with long-term ills, unemployment, underemployment, discrimination, unjust imprisonment, strife in their families, and the loss of loved ones. We raise to you especially this day those from our own faith family who have added their names to our prayer lists for the benefit of all who pray on their behalf. Especially, Lord, we recognize from your word, uh, from St. James' epistle, that where those who are righteous pray in great number, there is a great magnitude. Certainly, Heavenly Father, you hear the cries of your children, you remember your promises, and you act swiftly to deliver. So be with those who are most decidedly home-centered or shut in in this climate. Be with Harry and with Grace, with Don and with Lyle, with Rich and with Marge, with Marlis and with Muriel. We pray for those who need comfort these days, especially at the loss of loved ones. Help us to recall, especially by the resurrection hope, that for many who gather at the sides of urns and caskets, though it is so difficult to say goodbyes and farewells, this time is only temporary by your very promise. When it comes to those farewells, O Lord, we pray your comfort would rest upon us as we prepare for the day when we will see you face to face and when we see our family and loved ones again. Let it be that your guiding and comforting presence would rest upon the Rand family and the Myers family, the Bader family, the Johnston family, and the Cox family. We pray, O Lord, for those who have otherwise been hospitalized, those who are in deep need of your healing, and those who are celebrating the strength and relief that you renew day by day. Be with Cindy, with Dave, and with Arlene, with Laura, and with Catherine. We ask, O Lord, that you would continue to be with any and all in our communities, in our county, in the nation any and all around the world who are coping with the suffering and loss that has been caused by COVID-19. We pray, O oh Lord, especially for our county that as numbers continue to increase, that you would hold all of those healthy to be responsible, that you would help us and aid us in any way to love and serve our neighbor, and that as we've often prayed in this season, that you would surround us with a divine fence of your holy protection to keep us healthy and well and proclaiming your saving truth. We ask on behalf of those in our congregation who cope with cancers and with long-term illnesses that you would continue to guide and bless our faith family with remission and with cure. Be with young Piper and little Nolan, with Anne, with Daryl, with Carmine, with Ron, with Tom, and with Joy, with Lori, and with Matthew. These are brothers and sisters, Lord, wait upon you. We pray that we would continue to walk together to give one another strength and renewal as we wait to hear upon future prognosis and the road ahead. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be with any and all first responders and that as you work miracles through modern medicine that you would also be on the home front with all caregivers. Assure these, our brothers and sisters, that you are with them, even now a very present help in time of trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord of hosts, worthy to be exalted among the nations, into your almighty hands we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray. Hear our prayer for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Together we share the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And with that, on this day, receive the blessing, the very benediction of our Lord, who marks you with his name and sends you from this space to proclaim his eternal gospel. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. 
one announcement before we go on our way this day and celebrate our closing hymn. Again, a happy and blessed Reformation. As we look forward to the week ahead, just a fair reminder that on the overnight between October 31st and November 1st, daylight savings time comes to an end. You'll want to make sure to fall back in time for Sunday morning. Uh, and just the same, as you anticipate November 1st, please recall that our celebration of All Saints Day will take place on that weekend where we raise the names in commemoration of the faithful departed, all of those of our brothers and sisters in Christ who have been called home to heaven in the past year since our last commemoration of the faithful departed in 2019. May God bless you as we go from this space today together. We sing together selected verses of hymn 644, The Church's One Foundation. Thank you.